bring in our guest, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon, standing by. Uh, you were talking with me off camera about how reputable these two defense attorneys are in the area of Wisconsin. In fact, we've seen uh, them both on different cases that have been very high profile. Aaron Nelson on the Ezra McCandless case, representing her, and Corey Kiravisi, uh, representing Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, Michael, what do you think about how she asked about this woman's husband uh, having a knife on that day? Uh, to cut things on the river. I think it was really smart. I, I mean, look, it, you're trying to get as much out as you can to help him, right? And I think that's one thing that they really need to do. I, to me, I, sometimes it's hard, you know, asking these questions of people on the stand. Um, and, you know, a jury, you always run that risk of them getting like sort of disinterested along the way. Right. Sometimes these little like tidbits keep them interested and mm -hmm. keep them um, focused throughout the case. And I, I think it was smart. Right. That other people are bringing knives too to mm -hmm. cut things as part of their rafting, you know, adventure, tubing adventure on the river. And because when, when we're looking at the case in a vacuum, right, you think, oh, this guy has a knife in the midst of this, you know, what seemed to be a fist fight, it seems kind of strange. But if you think about what he had it for, uh, makes sense, exactly. Yeah. It? I mean, it's funny because when you read a police report or you watch these video, at first you're like, "Well, why did this happen?" But then, you know, in the context of everything, like, I mean, I here in Georgia, we we have Chattahoochee, and everyone floats right. down the Chattahoochee, and if you do, you probably want to bring some tools with you in case your float gets caught or right. stuck or something like that. So it it makes sense. I mean, if if you do it on a regular basis. Definitely, Michael Bixon. Thank you much. We're going to hit a break. When we come back, we'll hear from the next witness. We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, and I should never come up with this. His wife, Lori Valla Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet Chad Daybell on trial. Thanks so much for staying with us here on Court TV Live. Let's go back into the courtroom in Wisconsin now. I was just saying how we've had so many lay witnesses taking the stand. Now we've got a law enforcement witness. This is Sergeant John Farrell. You're about to see with the Somerset Police Department. He responded to that shooting on the Apple River on July 30th, 2022. And we're going to hear the 911 call that came in now. He pulled the knife. Okay, so we're on the river. Do you do you know where the man with the knife is? <laughs> and we are here, and somebody attacked some, one of our. Do you know where the man with the knife is? My knife. Okay. Everybody, calm down. Boss at one thirty-eight, Judge. Now I'm just gonna play the whole thing from the start. Um, somebody pulled, 
someone pulled a knife on our friend. So our friend has a knife because we have, we had, we used it for the rope. Someone take our, I don't even know. I have no idea what happened. Okay, do you know where the person with the knife went? The person that stabbed the other individual, do you know where they went? Oh, my God. I have no idea. Oh, my God. Okay, we have people help. Start your way, okay? Thank you. Okay. Hello? I don't have anything else, Judge. Mr. Shroffacy? Just a couple questions, Mr. Anderson. So, um, in the job, tell me if this is fair, the job of the people that you kind of supervise is to try to get as much information as possible about kind of what's happening. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And is it fair to say that in, uh, in your experience, um, Sometimes you get calls like this where people are just yelling and screaming and it's difficult for the for the dispatcher to really get any information about about what's going on. Is that fair? That is fair. Okay. And it can be for various reasons that, that, that that's happening, but in this particular case, um, is it I don't know if you can answer this question. At one point, the dispatcher says, we've got people coming, and then I think says that, and then kind of disconnects the call. Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. And is that, are they, if you know, are they trained to try to keep people on the phone, to disconnect calls, um, depending on the circumstances? How does that normally work? Depends on the circumstances. Um, in this case, there was numerous 911 calls, so the dispatchers were triaging, trying to gather the most pertinent information, the best information they could. And if they weren't getting any more information, they had to move on to the next call because there were other 911 lines ringing. Sure. And they, and it sounds like, at least from the information we have, there had been previous 911 calls about this incident. Is that fair? That is fair. Okay. So, thank you. Mr. Anderson? Nothing else, Judge. All right. Uh, thank you. You may step down. Can we approach again? All right, so that was the 911 dispatcher to get that call in. Now we're going to hear from the witness I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, Sergeant John Farrell with the Somerset Police Department, who responded to those stabbings. And there's going to be some really important body camera evidence that comes in through this witness. Let's watch. Uh, in a moment, we're going to have that video for you of this witness. He's number 21 in the state's case. Let's take a look. I'm dead. I believe there's three victims as we were responding to the scene. And did you head immediately to the scene or did you have to go somewhere else first? I had to grab a set of bolt cutters uh, out of the PD garage and then I went to the Sunrise Camp entry and had to cut the lock to get in and then I went directly to the scene. And is that uh, the Sunrise Camp em entry, is that uh, private property? Yeah. And is that, was that the best access to get to where the incident was reported to have happened? Yeah, there's a road that you can get on off Sunrise Drive in Somerset, and then it'll take you back to where the scene was. And the, is that a campground that's in operation or no? No. And the, the, the owner is given permission for law enforcement to use that when needed? Yeah, we had spoken to him in the past about it. Were you one of the first officers to arrive on scene? I was. And how many officers, if you recall, arrived there originally? I don't recall a specific number. Um, I know as I was um, approaching the scene, I saw a deputy Duran come down um, from the highway and then Officer Stumo was behind me. And there was a, also another deputy that was behind me that was at the gate when I opened it. And so what was the, can you kind of describe what the situation was when you got to the river? Yeah, there was, uh, I was being flagged down initially by people at the river bank. Um, as I approached them, 
I saw one guy come out that was holding his side. Uh, it was later determined that he had a stab wound on his side that was being directed down uh, into the river where a, a female was sitting in a tube um, whilst uh, bystanders were holding pressure on her left side. Um, when I looked, got down into the river, um, when I looked at her, I had noticed that uh, I could see what I believed to be bod her bodily organs outside of her body. Uh, Deputy Durand and I worked with bystanders to uh, get her out of the river. Um, during that time, we were trying to determine what, what you know, what was going on, where is the suspect. Um, there's a lot of information coming in at once, a lot of people in one spot. Um, we were able to get her out. The other person that was there that was stabbed came up as well. I uh, retrieved the medical kit from my squad car, um, provided some medical equipment to the other officers before I went to the river, uh, and then headed upriver to uh, where the other uh, victims were. And were there, while you were at the river when you initially got there, were there still groups of tubers going down the river? Yeah. And was there a good crowd of tubers around also? Yeah. Did you know who was witnesses, who were just bystanders, or was it kind of just people everywhere? There was people everywhere. I didn't know who was who. I mean, it was obvious to me who was injured, but other than that, I didn't know who witnesses were, suspects were, what anyone else's involvement was. Did you have a body cam on? I did. Does your body camera indicate that? Like I said, this body camera video is what is coming next. A big thank you to my guest, attorney Michael Bixon, for being here in the studio. Thank you for your time and for all the great analysis. Don't go anywhere. We're going to hit a quick break. When we come back, we're going to watch that video together here on Court TV Live. Court TV Live, I'm Ted Rollins, glad to be with you on this Thursday. We are watching testimony again from Wisconsin in that Nikolai Mew trial. Oof. He stabbed several people while tubing on the Apple River, killed 17-year-old Isaac Schumann. The defense says this group taunted him, this group of kids and young adults, and that he stabbed them in self-defense because he feared for his life. The prosecution says he was the aggressor. We'll get you back into the courtroom in just a bit. We're also monitoring Idaho. A jury could be seated as early as today in the Doomsday Profit Murder Trial for Chad Daybell. Day four of jury selection begins at any moment. The court needs just 13 more of these potential jurors before they move on to the next phase where the preemptory strikes are used and a final jury panel will be set. Our Matt Johnson is out there in Idaho. He'll be joining us for an update in uh, just a bit and throughout the day here on Court TV. But now let's go back to a Wisconsin will pick up the testimony. Sergeant John Farrell is on the stand. He was one of the original responding officers to the stabbing at Apple River. I mean, it does. Permission to approach? Yes. And you know what's been marked as Exhibit 22? Uh, what's that labeled as? Farrell BC video. BC body cam? Yes. Uh, Judge, I move to publish portions of it. I'm going to skip around a little bit to not show some of the up-close graphic parts. So first, any objection to Exhibit 22? No. All right, received. Go ahead and publish the portions you wish to show. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tell us when you're ready. Oh, and I'll ask another question. If we watch the first minute, would it just be you driving there? Yeah. We're going to start at 57 seconds, Judge. We're going to play to about the five minute mark for this first segment. <laughs> Q, 
cut the wrong side of it, of course. There. Slide. Good enough. If you want to have fire rescue space, let them know. Meet you up there. Potential victims on the river, whatever they do to get access to that. Katie, 15 is busy. Katie, 15, go ahead. Katie, 100 will be working on getting the investigators out. I wasn't aware of that when I talked to him. That's where I'll go. Did you get that trip? Dispatch Sunrise Access. It's open. Sunrise Access. Correct. We'll bend down to the river. That's where we'll get you. to dispatch should be on scene just underneath getting flagged down by people so we're paused at 253 um, can you see the time stamp on the bottom there I can what's the time uh, 1554 45 which is 354 p.m. the time of law enforcement's first arrival on scene yeah yes Screen again, please. And fifteen fifty four would be three fifty four PM. Yes. Is that right what I wrote up there? Yes. We're gonna keep playing until about the five minute mark. Stabbing already up here. The one kid that walked by you is too. Yep, we saw that. Okay, she got a knife on you. <laughs> I gotta go one more cut here. I have to hook this pressure to flip. Yep. Keep holding on here. Um, is there anybody that can get up to those? No, you're big now. 80 and 90 to 100. No, no, I know you do. I know you don't. You're doing good. Keep holding pressure. Okay. Yeah, so the paper throws helicopter is overhead and Fulton. <laughs> I think we can just pick her up. She's got a dissertation here. Chase, we're saying she has a bridge. If you could start a helicopter, let's get this underneath the tube. The one going. She got guts. Yeah, we're going to get her out of here. We stopped at 4.52. And did you end up assisting to carry Riley out of the river? Yes. Where'd you bring her? Uh, just up to the paved road there by the squad cars. What'd you do after that? 
I retrieved the medical equipment from my squad car and provided it to the officers who were tending to her, the other uh, subject that was stabbed next to my, that was sitting next to my squad car, and then I headed into the river. And we're going to play from about the eight minute mark. 7.59 is the timestamp. The suspect? Yes, he's, he's, he's a old man. I thought he was still stabbing people. Up the river. 4502 dispatch. We just received information. Suspect still has a knife and heading up river on foot. Two dispatch, I'm just getting up to 06. It does appear that EMS is clear to get up here. Just make sure they know the suspect's still at large. There's, we got officers up there at our entry point. If we can get a boat, that'd be great. Seals. If you got a seal, you need a seal. Yeah, I need. He's got the rope. Okay. Yep. We stopped at 10:50. That uh, first victim you stopped at and dropped off a chest seal. Yeah. Did you later learn that was AJ, or don't you know? I don't know. Okay. You know who that is up in the background there? Uh, which? On the bank to the right, that kind of obstructed by other people, but. The person that's being tend tended to medically and CPR is in progress. Um, I, I don't remember his exact name, but I believe his first name was Isaac. Okay. Did you, what did you do after this point? I went up to the group that was doing CPR on him. Um, and then assisted with that. Do you eventually assist getting people off the river? Yeah, when the paramedics arrived, they came up the river, then I assisted in getting him out of there. How did you get um, Isaac off the river with when you had to wade up like that? Yeah, a uh, backboard was placed on inner tubes and then floated down the river. I don't have anything else. <clears throat> Mr. Trophacy? Uh, just briefly. Uh, All right, that's the uh, direct, and uh, the, obviously the jury saw the entire body camera video, including the injuries, the chaos, all of that. Uh, before we hit a break, let's bring in Josh Schiffer and Jack Rice uh, to get their opinions on this overall uh, of this case. And uh, Jack, to you first, what, 
I can't wait to talk to you to see where you're at and where Josh is at on this one because so many of our viewers are separated. They're watching the same evidence, they're seeing the same video, and boy, they have different opinions. Where are you? Well, the first thing I want to say is, Ted, you use the word chaos. This is a perfect example of what we're talking about. You know, people sometimes want to look at these and they want to be able to say, look at how clean and antiseptic the evidence is and how you establish it. Think about the crime scene here. It's like at the bottom of an escalator and you have people continuing to come down that river on inner tubes, rolling straight through it. They're trying to control the crime scene. They're trying to get a hold of victims. They're trying to get a hold of a possible uh, perpetrator. All of that's happening all at once. This is a very complicated case and it has evidence that cuts both directions. And this is very, very difficult for a prosecution who's trying to get the right answer and losing a little bit of it as they go. Josh? But the messiness is the key here, and the messiness is what makes it a good defense case. The state's always obligated to have a, a narrative that's proven beyond a reasonable doubt. It's necessarily clear. It's necessarily something, it's a story that people can follow. We don't have that here. Watch these videos. The more exposure to these videos that the jury gets, the more difficult it is for any one specific version of events to be highlighted in their brain as being the truth. And that's where you find reasonable doubt. Uh, you know, especially in self-defense cases where the defense has done such a good job getting that jury to jump into the uh, the, the skin of the defendant, how would they react? Uh, I think the defense is doing a great job. There is uh, some issues coming up, though, for the defense um, with other body camera video because, remember, the defendant, when first approached, lied and said, I took the knife from one of these rascal kids, and um, that's a complete lie, and jurors are not going to likely uh, like that, because if you're Mr. I'm scared, you don't, you should have said I got my knife out because I was scared, and he didn't say that. So we'll see how this plays out. We'll get a break, get you back in the courtroom for more testimony with the cross-examination of this first responder right after this. The trial for against 54-year-old Nikolai Mew continues in the state of Wisconsin. He's accused of first-degree intentional homicide for the stabbing death of 17-year-old Isaac Schumann on the Apple River, which borders the state of Minnesota. He also faces charges for stabbing four others. He says this was all self-defense after a group attacked him on that river and surrounded him. He was fearful for his life. On the stand now is Sergeant John Farrell. We just watched his direct examination. He was one of the first to respond to the stabbing at the river. Now it's time for cross. I, I don't want to say you're not but you're focused on kind of what's going on and the investigation can kind of happen at a later point. That's that correct. Year. That's okay. correct. Okay. Um, at some point, your report indicates that you make it to the village park, is that right? Yes. Okay, so from what we saw there in the Times, how much later or how much time passes until you make it up to village park? Oh, I, I don't know the exact time. It's, it's, a, it's not immediate, it's a significant time, but I don't know the exact time. Okay, and we heard on the tape that you're getting uh, information as as it's kind of coming in, is that fair? Yes. Okay. Um, when you go to uh, Village Park, are you then starting to maybe switch over from emergency situation to kind of investigative situation? Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And you may contact at Village Park with a gentleman by the name of Eric Williams, is that right? That's right. Okay, and does he come up to you or do you go up to him? Um, he, I had directed him out of the crowd to come talk to me. There was a group gathered together. Okay, so did you have some information that he might have information? Um, I had in information that the people in the group may have information, but as to who, who knew what and who was where, um, no, I didn't have that until I started talking to him. Okay, and he had provided you at least some inf some brief information about kind of what was going on, right? Yes. Okay, and he had provided you information um, that he was with Mr. Meal, right? 
Yeah, in the same group, yes. And he had provided you information as to kind of what Mr. Mew was doing yes. previously, right? Yes. Okay. That he was looking for a phone, right? That's correct. Okay. At that point, do not take this as critical. At that point, you don't have any other information as to what had actually happened. Is that fair? Oh, what I mean by that is I know you saw people that had been injured, but how they were injured, the circumstances surrounding that, you didn't have that information, right? Some of the witnesses on, on the scene had mentioned stabbing, that that's what had happened. Sure. Um, but other than that, no. Okay. And you locate very tell me if this is fair you locate various uh, pieces of what may be physical evidence yeah in, in your mind yes okay. and that was a shirt and a pair of swim goggles yes okay uh, are the goggles goggles like you would see are they snorkel goggles or are they goggles like a swimmer who's competing I don't I don't remember exactly what they were okay After your interview with Mr. Williams um, and your walking kind of of the river, is that your involvement in the case? Yeah, that's the involvement, yeah. I was, um, well, I had been given a ride back, and that's when you said, when I assisted with finding the evidence in the river, the T-shirt, the goggles. So there's that space between Village Park and where the incident actually had occurred where I initially responded to. So I had gone from there back to that spot, and that's when I assisted in that searching where I found the T-shirt and the swim goggles. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. So after that's done, your involvement in, in kind of what happened here has concluded. Is yeah. that fair? Yes. Okay. So I have to, thank you. Mr. Anderson, anything else? Nothing else. All right. Thank you, Sergeant. You may step down. All right, as we wait for the next witness, let's bring back Jack and Josh. Josh, to you first, what, how significant is it that um, the defendant lies to investigators out of, the, out of the gate, police saying that he took the knife from these armed individuals? It, it, it's a huge issue, but it, it doesn't necessarily, you know, sink his boat by any means. Lots of people would be, be like, oh my gosh, lies, we can't trust him. That's gonna mean he's guilty, no. That's not the causal connection here. We've got a lie, but that means you can't trust what he says. Not that anything specific happened. The state still has to carry that burden, prove who the primary aggressors were, prove how this fight unfolded. So all that we know now is that this officer saw what was on the video and then stopped. It's a limitation on the story. It's a limitation on the evidence that that officer can bring because he didn't see everything. And then when he put some lies on top of it, it's not he didn't do it. It's we can't tell what happened as a defense. Mm. All right, let's, uh, we, the next witness just took the stand, so let's go back in. Sergeant Chase Duran, St. Croix County Sheriff's Office. I was assigned to our unit and have attended a uh, three-day um, trauma care training. Were you working back on July 30th of 2022? Yes, I was. Uh, did you get dispatched to the uh, incident on the Apple River? I did. Uh, what information were you given in the, the initial call? Uh, was there air to us from dispatch that there have been several people stabbed on the Apple River and dispatch that it was near the 64 bridge in Somerset Township. Where were you located when you first got called? I was in the Holton area. About how far away? I'm sorry. About how far away? Uh, nine miles. Uh, did you drive over to the area where the, the call <laughs> was coming from? Yes, I responded to Mergent. Um, and the area I'm familiar with, uh, there's a private road underneath the bridge um, with no off-ramp on the highway there on 64. I parked up on top of the um, overpass and then went down the embankment to the river. Um, oh, when boy. you arrived, were there other officers uh, on scene? I first saw Officer Farrell, or Sergeant Farrell from Somerset PD. Do you remember any other officers you saw? Um, once I got upriver, when we waded to the river and then came across 
Officer Stumo at that location where the two victims were in the water still. All right, so before you get into the river, did, did you get involved in some of the activities that were going on on shore? Yes, uh, when I first arrived and made my way down the embankment, I came across, um, it was hectic and there was a lot of people near the bridge. Uh, there was one male subject who was able to walk, who had a, observed a, what looked like a stab wound. And then I was directed with Officer Fer or Sergeant Farrell to several other, sorry, to another female laying in her tube that had a uh, wound to her left side. We used uh, my soft stretcher to, with the help of uh, bystanders to evacuate her out of the water up to the road where I passed her off to another officer, deputy arriving. And after you did that, uh, did you enter the river? Yes. At that point, had you been given any information as to uh, who the suspect was or what they looked like? Once I um, entered the water, people were yelling that it was a guy wearing scuba gear and he went back up river. Right. You didn't have a, a physical description? At that time, no. Uh, were you wearing a, a body camera at the time that you uh, responded to the river? I was. Uh, on my first arrival with the first two victims I came across, um, it wasn't recording, and then when I uh, checked it going up river, I had to open up, it was our old body cam system, I had to open up the phone app and uh, activate it. It wasn't turning on with the button. All right. So if I understand you, part of what you did isn't on your body cam? Correct. Uh, would that have been the activities that you were involved in with Sergeant Farrell? Um, the initial response with the first two victims you located, and then once I entered the water, to go up river, that's when my body cam turned on. I approach a witness, Sharon. Yes, you may. Sergeant, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 43. Uh, can you tell us what that is? Uh, flash drive. And how's it labeled? Uh, Durand evidence with 43 on the. This is BC oh. at the top. All right. Durand BC video. And BC stands for? Body cam. I'm going to ask the move for admission of 43 and ask to publish. Any objection to 43? All right. Exhibit 43 is received. Go ahead and play it. Again, I'm going to just give a warning that some of the images on this body cam are, are graphic, so anybody who may be concerned may want to leave. So, members of the jury, um, what you're about to see is difficult. Um, it is evidence. You may consider it. Uh, watch as much as you can. If you need to avert your eyes for a moment, you may. But I ask that you pay as close attention as you can because this is evidence in the trial. Mr. Smithston. Okay, Judge you're telling the jury, feel free to look away if you have to because this video that they're about to play will be a graphic in nature at times. So it's going to break. We'll watch the video portions of it, the part we can watch uh, when we return. In the past, was Mr. Pryor or his law firm? No, and just to be clear, that's the defendant's attorney again. No one answered yes. Are any of you related by blood or marriage to any of the lawyers in this case, or do you know any of them from any kind of professional, business, or social relationship? No one answered yes to that. Have any of you ever formed... This is a live look inside the courtroom in Idaho, where it is day four of jury selection in the Chad Daybell case. Uh, we're close to getting a jury there. Uh, they're anticipating that that could happen by days, and they have 37 prospective jurors that will be advancing to that final round of 50, so they only need 13 more. He's accused, of course, of killing his first wife, Tammy, and the two... Uh, 
youngest children of Lori Vallow Daybell. Stick around uh, in just a bit. We're going to be checking in with crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson. He's going to join us from the courthouse out there and give us an update. And we could have opening statements in that case as early as tomorrow. Meanwhile, hmm. Testimony continues in Wisconsin. The Apple River Stabbing Trial. This one uh, is fascinating. 54-year-old Nikolai Mew is accused of killing a teenager and stabbing four others while on this tubing uh, excursion on the Apple River. He's claiming self-defense. He lies to investigators to, or to police saying that the knife that he used to, to cut these kids, he claimed he took it from one of the kids, that they were armed. That wasn't true. Uh, how will that affect him? We're going to be um, watching today a lot of the body camera worn, uh, body worn camera video, and that's what we're we're at right now. On the stand is Sergeant Chase Durant. Before we went to break, we heard the judge warn jurors that this is going to be graphic. So uh, we're going to go in. We're going to watch the video, uh, the portions that we can, and um, then we'll talk about it afterwards. Let's watch. Eighty fifteen Hello? Okay. What does this mean? Is that the I'm also looking for the suspect. I'll work on the description. I heard one person say scuba gear. Was our furthest downriver casualty point? 64 bridge. Gen Park believed to be going downriver. I can head straight down there. Negative. Suspect went into the woods at the initial location, quarter mile upriver from the 64 bridge. Gen Park. Did he go off on the north or south bank? South bank. The side of cars are on. Jay, do you want me to continue up to you or do you want me to take my squad up the road further into the woods? Yep. Up the river. The question. Eric, just go to the woods. We need to see EMS here and get these people out of here. I just talked to rescue. They're working on getting them out into the water and up to get. Okay. Great. Can one of you hold his hand? 21 to 29. Careful, please be careful. The rotor and the rescue 
Up on the riverbank, if you can get guys. to wash it out, buddy. Is that way up there, right there? The road isn't that far from the riverbank. Just hold that there, okay? Just leave that there. Yeah, okay. Hey, you hold on, okay? Okay. Stand for it. You'll have to squeeze past their slots and stuff. Yeah, if you'll point that way. Shirts, clothes. Put shirts in a t-shirt. Okay. Uh, a white t-shirt. Oh, no, he had his t-shirt off in a hot belly. Older man, older man, he's in his 50s, 60s. He just has a knife. 46 to 29. AJ, AJ, AJ. I'm just coming through the ridge. Yeah, pressure on his stomach. Hold what? Pressure. Yep, I'll go to the end of the Sunrise Trail and we'll link up there. 8019 dispatch. Suspect information. 8019, what's the suspect? Being told a white male, some shorts, shirtless, armed with a knife. Possibly 50 years old. One this person described him as Russian looking. Yeah. 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 Do we have a color on those swim shorts? Negative. Can't get that yet. Uh, also, two of the friends of the person ran off into the woods are looking for the suspects. We have some other people contaminating the area. For adult male, approximately 50 years of age, shirtless, wearing unknown color swim shorts, with a knife, and two friends of victims are out looking for the suspect as well. 1608. 8019 dispatch. 8019. Disregard. Where'd the suspect go into the woods at? I, I didn't Somewhere see that. Somewhere This way, have you ever seen an uncommon? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I know, I know. I saw him before the fight started. I have a rag. I don't know how much it's going to help. And then he but if it's going to help anybody, if you want to fly with another rag. One here, one there. 88, 44, 88, 29. They don't know. Okay. No one knows. Okay. That's, they said this region. They don't know exactly where. Okay. Uh, I have these two trauma bandages. I got a tourniquet and some quick clot, Z bolt. His guts are hanging out. The other one, I haven't been over to that one yet. Let's throw that on his hair. Do you know? I think 29 up the road here, farther. Try to set yeah. up perimeter. Uh, at the end of Sunrise Trail here, it's pretty thick. I'm not going to be able to see much of down here. I would say go to the highway and start looking on that way. Hold on, wait up there somewhere. 10-4, we'll be running the highway. Take it off. Yeah. 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 Is this? No, 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 no. Okay. You guys see him? Yeah, we need an IPS. Two critical patients up the river. Do you have a team to go to extract them? I didn't catch that. We're a quarter mile up the river from the bridge. We can see the squads. One, no vitals. See fire in progress. I believe I have EMS in the area. Do we have any helicopters in route for Lakeview or Lifelink? Affirmative. Two helicopters at this time. 8821 dispatch. 21. About a tenth of a mile up river from the bridge. We have a male suspect with a abdominal stab wound and a laceration to the leg. We have another male subject with a lateral lash across his abdomen. And we have one subject with a stab wound to the chest. Feet down in progress. 
Sentinel, three victims, one death of a mile up the river. Legs stab, open half of and a chest stab. Ellie, I'm annoying. I know I'm annoying. I know, I know. it's hard, but it's need additional agencies to assist with uh, perimeter? Yes. And I don't know. State Patrol's helicopter was in the area of Minnesota. I don't know if that's something we can utilize. Yep, there we go. That is it. Hey, Zay, you keep talking. You keep talking. Hey, 16 dispatch. If there's one available in Seattle, Polk County, I can send some deputies on. Keep talking. Sergeant Duran did. Okay, um, oof, that uh, video just really does demonstrate the chaos after the stabbings. It's going to break, get you back into the courtroom with more right after this. We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Morgan, I should ever come up with this. His wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. To the courtroom we go in the Apple River stabbings trial in the state of Wisconsin for the defendant Nikolai Mew. We just watched the video, the body camera worn video from the sheriff deputy, the sergeant. His name is Chase Duran. Let's go back in now for questioning. Cam, uh, did you run up into the woods? Yes. What was that all about? Uh, there was movement up in the woods, people yelling at somebody. I ran up there. Um, determine those two people that were going to go try to find the suspect. Um, I told him to come back due to us having a uh, canine coming, not to mess up the scent for the dog, and then confuse the perimeter or any type of aerial drone or helicopter assets coming to assist searching. Did you know who those uh, folks were up in the woods that were looking for the suspect? No. Um, did you see yourself on, on your body cam saying that they were friends of the victims? Yes, I, through the yelling in the crowd, I determined there was some type of relationship with the people. But as of today, you don't know if they had any connection to these victims? I don't know their exact connection. And what, uh, when, you, when you went up into the woods, um, you asked the, one of the people up there what, the, what the, vic or the suspect looked like? Yes. And what was his response? He didn't know. So it appears that, from your body cam at least, you were coordinating the response to this incident? Yes. Is that part of your duties as a sergeant? Yes, it is. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, were you trying to get any info you could gather about who did it? Yes. And you were able to get some bits and pieces of that information? Yes, there was a lot of information being thrown at me or uh, people yelling, but one person I had talked to um, and the yellow shirt had the most amount of information about the suspect. Um, were you also in, in the process of trying to set up a perimeter to make sure that the suspect didn't get away? Yes. Um, at some point, did you call for a state patrol helicopter? Yes, when I was in Holt and I saw that Minnesota's um, state patrol helicopter was over Stillwater prior to coming to the call. And what was the purpose of calling the State Patrol, Minnesota State Patrol helicopter? Uh, their air assets have uh, thermal cameras. Wisconsin's airplanes do not. Did the Minnesota State Patrol helicopter respond to the area? I do not know. <clears throat> Nothing further. Mr. Shroffacy? Okay, that was the uh, direct after the body camera video. Jack, Josh, still with us. Uh, Josh, or Jack, you guys up in Minnesota have better technology than us down in Wisconsin. Uh, the, so uh, what do you take from uh, the, that chaos that it's more of the same, this jury's getting overwhelmed by it? Uh, what's your take? 
there's more chaos than I think is even obvious because what you have is people coming from all different directions. They don't know who anybody is. And remember, even more people are coming, floating down that river. So they're just rolling down that escalator into the crime scene. But let's add something else. The Somerset Police Department, that's one of the local cities in the Wisconsin area where this took place. There's also the St. Croix Sheriff's Office, a different jurisdictional unit that oversees the county. They're pulling in the troopers and the assets from Minnesota, which are just, just across the St. Croix River. So they're coming across from a different state. All of this is happening at the same time. These happen in murder investigations, and that's one of the complications because of the seams between those organizations. Yeah, final word, Josh, before we hit a break. Um, the Is this self-defense or murder? Uh, I think that it's a very effective self-defense claim, and I think the defense is going to have a really good result because of exactly what Jack's talking about. This is a super muddy case. No one has a clear story, especially the state. And that's before we even start talking about regional delicacies uh, between Minnesota and Wisconsin, because it goes completely off the rails there. They're not going to be able to agree on anything. <laughs> that's true. Uh, uh, we'll get a break. Jack's going to stick around. When we come back, Julia Janae, thanks, Josh, uh, will uh, help us through the next couple hours here. We'll get you back to the courtroom right after this. Stay with us.